Alright, we're going to talk about aircraft design in this particular module. We're going to talk about standard conventions that relate to both fixed wing aircraft and also multi-rotor aircraft and the minor differences that are made and uh, the reasons that they are made for different types and styles of each of these aircraft. Now, we will be going through each of these in detail. Uh, we understand that if uh, you are only looking at a multi-rotor, uh, the fixed wing may seem a little bit irrelevant, but this course is really designed to equip you for both the fixed wing and the multi-rotor. So if you decide to change later on down the track um, and you've trained on the multi-rotor, you can then go and pick up fixed wing without any further theory training. Now we're going to start with the fixed wing. Essentially, we're going to talk about the major components that make up an aircraft. Now, they're pretty standard regardless of whether they are a UAV or whether they're a, um, a full-size fixed-wing aircraft. Uh, the difference in the UAVs, of course, is uh, we can use a lot of styles and shapes that you can't normally use in conventional aircraft uh, in the full-size type because we've got to be able to fit people in. Uh, because of that, in UAVs, a lot of small flying wings are used. Uh, and the reason for that is they're a very efficient design. Nonetheless, they still have basically all the features that any standard uh, aircraft or fixed wing will actually have. So you've got a fuselage, the midsection where all of our components go, you've got your wings and your tailplane. In this case, the tailplane is actually out on the wingtips, which gives the vertical stability for the aircraft so that it doesn't uh, wander around in the sky too much and behaves a bit like a dart. So those are your basic components of a fixed wing. Now, in a conventional fixed wing, of course, you'll have a tail plane and your motor might be at the front or it might be at the back, but the same theories still apply. Also, the main thing that we see in fixed wings is control surfaces. In this particular case, there are only two, one on the left wing, one on the right wing, and they're called elevons. They control both the pitch and the roll of the aircraft, so they're a dual control surface. There is no rudder on a flying wing, generally speaking, because they're very ineffective. So we rely mostly on a, a bank and roll scenario, which means they do have wind limitations. Mind you, those limitations far, are far outweighed by the efficiency benefits, with flying wings being over 20% more efficient than conventional fixed wing aircraft. Now, these are electric. All of our aircraft that we use are electric. And of course, as electric aircraft, they have a, a set of standard components. An electric brushless motor at the back here, that could be anywhere on the aircraft, could be on the front, could be on the back, doesn't really matter. Underneath we've got an electronic speed controller, and that controls all of the, uh, the speed of the motors, but we talk more about that in electric aircraft overview. And under the top here, we have our battery, our sensor, in this case a small camera, and our flight control system and receiver. Also got a set of sensors, an airspeed sensor, and a GPS on this particular aircraft. Okay, so we're looking at the fixed wing in close-up now. Um, essentially, we're going to look at the construction of this particular fixed wing, and then we're going to look at how it actually manoeuvres. Now, in this particular case, as you can probably see in close-up, this fixed wing is made out of foam. This is what's called EPP expanded foam. Very, very tough, very durable, and very inexpensive. It has a tendency to protect your sensors from hard landings, which you don't normally get um, that kind of protection from other materials. But UAVs are made from all sorts of stuff. They can be made from wood, they can also be made from carbon fibre, they can be made from fibreglass. So the uh, construction of a UAV is very much dependent on what it's doing. And in this case, being so small, this is the best structure. It's nice and light, it's nice and strong, keeps its form, and is easy to repeat in its manufacture. Now the way fixed wings actually do what they do is they, uh, the, in the respect of manoeuvring, is they move their control surfaces and generate lift. Now, lift we'll be talking about further in aerodynamics, but generally speaking, uh, it will generate lift on one side, decrease lift on the other in order to turn. And if it's looking to put its nose up, it will increase lift going down at the back of the wing, and also put its nose down, it will increase lift at the back of the wing. So the whole system of a fixed wing revolves around control surfaces giving and taking away lift. That's the most important design feature you can think of when you're talking about fixed wing aircraft. Because if you've got a control surface that's not getting a lot of airflow over it, it's not going to be generating a lot of lift, and so it's going to be completely ineffective. So designing aircraft where the control surfaces will achieve a reasonable amount of airflow is paramount. So if you're getting into designing your own UAVs, making sure that it follows these appropriate conventions will help a lot. 
So with that in mind, um, small variations on the pattern uh, achieve quite major things. So this particular small fixed wing uh, can fly for around half an hour um, and it's quite efficient in small enclosed spaces. But when it comes to large amounts of wind or heavier payloads, it's next to useless. So you need to go up to a much larger fixed wing to carry the next size and sensor. You're looking at double the size of aircraft to carry a digital SLR or a micro digital SLR. So big changes depending on what you're trying to do. No single UAV will be able to do everything. Um, and it's important to, uh, to source a UAV that will achieve your purpose and uh, making sure that uh, the purposes that you're looking for don't require more than one UAV. And if they do, getting the appropriate systems in place that you can share and use across those platforms. We'll now talk about the multi-rotor side. Again, similar to the fixed wing, they all follow a basic pattern, and that is a frame, motors, and ESCs. Okay, now looking at our frame here, we've got uh, essentially exactly that. It's a frame. Um, it's a skeleton that holds all of our main components on. In this particular case, it's an aluminium frame. Aluminium is a wonderful framing material simply from the point of view that it's very durable, it's quite light, and it's easy to replace. It also protects your components because it tends to bend rather than break. However, in a lot of frames, you might find them being made out of carbon fibre, fibreglass, or even wood in some cases. It's all dependent on the function of the multi-rotor. The actual design itself is changed according with uh, what the multi-rotor is doing. In this particular case, because we're not worried about forward camera view, we actually have a fully symmetrical hexacopter. Whereas in cases where you've got a camera at the front which has got a wide field of view, you'll find that these front arms are actually usually splayed further out. And the whole vehicle is uh, changed to accommodate that centre of gravity change. So attached to our arms are our motors. These are standard brushless motors. They're not specifically uh, multi-rotor motors, but they certainly work quite well. And in a training vehicle like this, uh, the ability to get hold of um, replacement motors easily is one of the main, main sort of concerns. We also have our ESCs um, underneath in the, uh, the airflow which we need to uh, keep cool and that's a convention that you'll see on most multi-rotors in the respect that they are out in the airflow to stay cool and also to easily uh, replace them. More advanced uh, aircraft will have a different system. Um, in this particular case though it's ease of access and ease of uh, uh, acquisition, the idea of the placement of the ESCs. Directly underneath the, uh, the frame here we've got our battery. And the reason that it's directly underneath is to allow a good centre of gravity, because if the uh, centre of gravity for the multi-rotor is out in the respect that it will tip backwards or forwards or left or right, it means the flight control has to work harder. And working harder means working a certain set of motors harder as well, which wears them out faster and you use more power. So a well-balanced multi-rotor will be one that doesn't work anywhere near as hard. Now the way multi-rotors work in general actually manoeuvring is all to do with the rate and spin of these motors. For example, if we want to turn our multi-rotor to its left, your right, you would find that this motor here would speed up, this motor would slow down, and the aircraft would tip to the left. If you want to go to the right, same in reverse, and uh, forwards and backwards, we would be speeding up to go the back two motors to go forwards and the forward two motors to go backwards. Now, that's all pretty straightforward, but when it comes to yawing the aircraft, rotating it on its axes, um, multi rotors do things in a very interesting way, on the exception of tricopters. But most multi rotors um, essentially use the centrifugal force or the torque force off their motors to actually yaw them. Uh, in this particular multi-rotors case, three of, the, of these motors are spinning in one direction and the other three are spinning in the other direction. To spin in one way, uh, to actually rotate the aircraft in one direction, it will speed up three of those motors and slow down the other three and find that the aircraft will start to yaw. Same in reverse. With the tricopter, the reason it's different is it uses its rear motor attached to a servo to actually yaw the copter by changing the orientation of the motor itself. So really it depends on the, uh, the aircraft as to how it's constructed, but it all follows a base pattern of frame, your motors attached to your frame, ESCs in the airflow, um, flight control in the middle on the centre of gravity, battery either underneath or on top but on the centre of gravity, and that pretty much puts together a multi-rotor. 
So um, with that basic pattern, there's a huge variety of different types and shapes. Um, ranging from very, very large multi-rotors that are around the 20 kilogram mark when loaded, right through to very, very small multi-rotors down around the two or 300 grams. Depending on what you're doing depends on the type of multi-rotor that you grab, but they're all assembled very, very similar. This is one of our training aircraft. You can also carry a, a reasonable uh, compact camera. Um, we've then got our propellers, which are the most important part of a multi-rotor, making sure that they are going to do an appropriate job, which is a fine pitch and a broad propeller to give good efficiency. Fastened well with a, an appropriate collet. Bolt-on collets are best, but friction fit collets like these are quite acceptable in a training aircraft. And this particular aircraft is essentially a mid-range, mid-sized multi-rotor. Loaded, it's about two and a half kilos, so it's not very large, but it's about middle of the road, and it's a hexacopter. Now, hexacopters give you a certain amount of stability and a certain amount of redundancy that you don't get with smaller numbers of uh, rotors or motors. Um, ultimately, in a commercial world, you need a minimum of six if you're running a relatively heavy aircraft. Normally, uh, people who are running larger cameras, such as full-size DSLRs or things like uh, infrared cameras, are running octas, so eight motors and props. However, if you're doing some close proximity um, and inspection work, it may be unnecessary to use something of this size. And so things, variations on the pattern like this little guy here could be used in close quarters inspections where a large aircraft is not necessary. So the variation on the design is of course two less motors and a very, very different frame designed to be very, very lightweight and streamlined. This is actually a racing quad. We do occasionally use them for training, but uh, dependent on what your use is, depends on how the design actually goes together. But the conventions are the same regardless of the type. So variations on a single pattern are due mainly to the limitations of design itself for aerodynamics for the fixed wing and also the limitations of the board for the multi-rotor. Depending on what the board can do depends on the design that you can achieve. Um, these particular boards are very, very flexible, so your range of design could be very, very broad. And you can do things like move motors out of the way to actually get clear camera shots. So that's another uh, for, uh, function follows form feature with multi-rotors that you see quite often. The most important thing to remember for all electric aircraft is that they do follow us that set of conventions and we do need to make sure that everything is placed in accordance with best practice and allow us to do the job that we're doing and selecting aircraft appropriate to the task. So this aircraft will not do things that this aircraft will do, and this aircraft can do things that this aircraft can't do. So making sure that we are very clear about what we need in the vehicle and uh, achieving that by good design.